Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. My name is Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francisca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. We're going to share with you the latest ideas and solutions about sargassum, which has become an international challenge. Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you today to uh, our podcast. And all that, uh, we got a really good day here ahead of you. And all, we got a really nice lady from uh, De- Debbie Bartlett from uh, the UK. And kind of excited to talk about her. We've been chatting with her a little bit, getting to know her, and, and it's been fun. And all, but uh, Francisca, uh, Mara, have you guys got anything you want to share with us before we get started today? Uh, got I don't nothing. Have much. Okay. It's just been snowing here in Switzerland, but that's about it. What about you, Mark? I'm really busy preparing a meeting from our data set from Peru, and I'm struggling because that country is now kind of closed for anything related to research. And so it's um, tough to get things together. But yeah, moving on. Yeah, well, well, well cool. Well, you know, like I was talking about earlier, Com- con, uh, completing the impossible is pretty cool stuff. So I'm, I think you'll, you'll do good and all. But um, today we're talking to uh, Debbie Bartlett. She's a professor in environmental conservation at the University of Greenwich. Her background is consultancy and she had a, has working experience with uh, working with local authorities and government agencies before moving to full-time employment in academia. Together with John Millage, who we interviewed uh, early, in an earlier episode, she works at the Darwin Plus Project to find sustainable lo- solutions for sargassum inundations in the Turks and the Caicos. And as a part of this, she conducted one of our, one of the first studies to determine the social and economical impacts of sargassum has on the islands and a lot of really other cool stuff we just found out about. And so Debbie, welcome today. Thank you, delighted to be here. Yeah, welcome very much, Debbie. And I have the honor to ask you our first question which we ask to everybody who um, comes to our podcast. And the question is, what is sargassum? I think sargassum is a really interesting um, group of species. We have, we have sargassum here, which is completely different to the sargassum that you're talking about, which is in the Caribbean. And the sargassum we have here is, is muticans. It's the Japanese wireweed. And it's an invasive species, but it has a hole fast, so it has to fix on to um, surfaces, and then it grows for for meters, and shading out, shading shading out things. And the usual problem with um, invasive species that if you harvest it um, for any any purpose, any tiny bit that you leave will will um, attach itself down and grow to meters length again. Wow. But the sargassum that we see in the in the Caribbean, I, I think, is absolutely fascinating because it's a community. It's a mat, a floating mat of, of algae, um, with amazing quantities of other things mixed in there. And I think we really do not understand at all what's what's going on. Yeah, that's true. Um, so Debbie, am I understanding correctly that you've also done some research on nature-based solutions? And by doing this, you've um, come in touch with a lot of local communities around the world. And so why do you mm-hmm. think that nature-based solutions are important? And what is your favorite nature-based solution at the moment? That's a very complicated question. Um, I, what I think is really interesting about nature-based solutions is it's a new term that's come out of the IUCN work. Um, and I am involved in the Commission on Ecosystem Management. Um, but actually it's something we've been doing for years. 
And, and some people object to the term nature-based solutions saying, well, it's what ecologists and landscape architects and, and natural resource managers, it's what we've always done. But I think the thing that's special about nature-based solutions is the emphasis on societal problems. And the fact that that is brought into the, the definition and it's, yeah, we're, we're moving from ecosystem services and looking what nature does for us to looking at, okay, so what problems have we got that nature can help us solve? I did write a chapter in the, um, the book, the Springer book, Nature-Based Solutions for Southeast Asia, uh, looking at um, how landscape character assessment, which is a tool that we use um, in in landscape um, studies and particularly um, getting local people's input to landscape character assessment could inform planning decisions to ensure that the right nature-based solution was, was put in place. Because it's no good us thinking we understand, we don't understand the intricacies of that particular environment. So it's really important to um, to find a, a participatory methodology that can enable um, local people to actually inform that decision making process. Read the chapter. I see that mm -hmm. on, on land that's uh, relatively straightforward, but in the ocean it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because of course you have the coastal communities but the ocean is all connected to each other. So whatever happens in the middle of, of the subtropical gyres that actually belong to no one uh, is affecting a lot of communities um, along the coast. So how do we do this thing with the oceans, with the marine environment? How do we involve communities? Because the ocean is all connected. So whatever happens in the Amazon River um, outcome in Brazil is affecting the Caribbean people and the West Africa people. So how do we deal with this for nature-based solutions in the ocean? I think it's what we call a wicked problem, isn't it? <laughs> we come across the term wicked problem. Um, I, like I, I, think, I think that we, we have no idea what's actually causing the expansion of sargassum. Mm. There's some ideas. Yes, some people say, well, Sahara dust. Other people say soil erosion from Amazon deforestation. But I think the one thing we can be sure of is that it's associated with environmental change. And in my teaching, I, I try to stop students using, um, using words carelessly, uh, sustainable, biodiversity and climate change you know they're kind of um they're actually complicated so i prefer to think in terms of environmental change because what's happening is that climate change in all its different facets is altering the environment mm -hmm. now some we did we did some work in um turks and Caicos Islands, looking at what local local people who were associated with um, coastal activities thought about sargassum. Because a lot of fuss is made about, oh, it's ruining the tourist industry. And, and yes, not ruining it as much as COVID has done, I don't think, but that's a different issue. So yes, um, rotting seaweed on the beaches in front of hotels is a bad thing. However, that by itself is producing employment um, activities, uh, empl opportunities is the word I'm looking for, for a lot of people who possibly wouldn't have a employment otherwise. So we need to kind of factor that in I think we found on, um, certainly on, on Provo, that the people who were doing the clearing were actually from outside the islands, probably weren't on very high wages, but it was still a job. The other 
issue was that the game fishers, who actually have quite a lot of tourists going out there to fish for, for game fish, they thought the sargassum was really good <laughs> because it's providing a hunting ground for those big fish that they wanted to catch. And they said, I don't know, Fran, I don't know whether you think this is true or not. They said the number of sharks in the area had gone up dramatically. I actually haven't heard and I'm not sure if I, may, maybe, but I have seen one shark hunting under Sargassum once at Shark Bay. But other than that, I haven't really seen links between shark and sargassum. Well, we talked to game fishermen on um, all three islands. Um, I, I, I don't actually know how big it is as an industry across that area. They all said the same thing. And they said that um, it was a nuisance because it got caught on their lines and they had to clean it off their lines. But they would always go near the sargassum because that's when they'd get these big tuna and marlin and I think they're blue marlin and yellow, you know, I'm, I'm not very familiar with these fish, but, and they said that, you know, the numbers were fantastic and that was what their clients wanted. But they said that unfortunately, quite often, they'd pull in a fish and it would have a big shark shaped bite taken out of it. Oh wow. <laughs> so they were adding this to their evidence of the sharks and saying they were seeing them all the time. So I, th well, I thought that was quite interesting, but um, in terms of, you know, a full economic study, you'd have to look at the cost benefit analysis and mm -hmm. um, employment opportunities. Um, Debbie, what about the local fishermen? I, kn I know you talked to some local fishermen as well. Did, did you get some ideas of how they saw the sargassum? Yes, I mean, it, it was quite difficult to tell because I, I had the um, assumption, not being a marine biologist at all, but I sort of had it in my head that um, you know, the conch and the lobster that they're fishing for are associated with the seagrass meadows. So surely um, the sargassum, if it's shaded, because of my experience here with sargassum shading out um, mm -hmm. other communities, you know, surely that would be bad um, for those areas. But they didn't seem to be... Um, there didn't seem to be much of a feeling about that and there didn't seem to, you have to be very careful not to ask leading questions, but there didn't seem to be any concern about um, numbers. It was very hard to tell um, the extent to which there was any monitoring of, of the fishery. Mm -hmm. I suppose there must be because so much conch is exported and lobster is exported. Yes, I think the DCR is doing monitoring. They are taking sizes and, and write down how many are caught and, and processed in the processing um, areas. So and maybe, maybe they're seeing an effect, uh, but the fishermen didn't, didn't seem concerned. I mean, I guess it depends on how long the sargassum stays over the over the seagrass shadowing it because if it's just a temporary path mm. and it doesn't matter but if it stays there for a long time then of course it destroys the whole ecosystem below yeah. it. And we actually I did um, snorkel surveys with my students to look at the seagrasses and on beaches with a lot of sargassum we saw fields of just stumps of seagrasses which were completely gone from where it was close to the coast out to like 100 meters or 50 meters depending on where we were from the coast so the seagrass beds further out were okay but the ones really close to the coast were, were gone but I think the fishermen don't go that close 
No, they go further out, don't they? They go further out. So yeah. I think that may be why it didn't affect them. I do remember, though, in August, September 2019, when we had a lot of sargassum, and at the same time, a lot of very, like, brown and dark water, maybe due to the sargassum, but also kind of far out. So yeah. we, we aren't sure where that, you know, turbid water came from. And that was right at the beginning of lobster season. And the fishermen were not happy because the first two weeks of lobster season is when they make most of their money and they couldn't find nice. their lobsters. But I think later on when it cleared up, they were able to find those lobsters and maybe it made up for it. But those first two weeks, they weren't happy at all. That the lobster might have been lobster. bigger. <laughs> Well, the thing, the thing about the, 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 the seagrass meadows and the mangrove ecosystems, um, you know, the, the lobsters feed on there, they're, they're, they're carnivores, they, they, uh, mm -hmm. they eat snails and whatnot, and they can't live there. And but the thing is that overlooked and how this is also affected if the seagrass, any of the seagrass meadows dies, that, you know, except for the pelagic fish you were talking about a minute, a minute ago, every com economically important fish species, marine species, spends yeah. one phase of his life in the seagrass meadows and or mangroves yeah so even if it's not where they're if the stores not where they're fishing they're destroying a, a important nursery and juvenile habitat and without that to support this stuff that this some of the stuff's just gonna go away um as far as uh how quickly they recover i don't know from a killing like that maybe the rhizomes live and, and regrow or something after the a shading event or whatever it's going but what i do know is there's a couple places in belize that were dredged in the 90s to fill in mangrove uh islands to have so shiny white beaches for mm. tourists and and i fished behind those and, and and those um seagrass meadows that were were dredged then have still not recovered today mm. and it's, it's just mm. like a desert under there you, you just touch the bottom and just mud just goes everywhere right. and uh i, I have but, not seen any life <clears throat> inside these areas that were inundated by this dredging 30 years ago but what we don't understand about sargassum is we don't understand the seasonality we don't understand what's causing it we don't understand how how long it stays in any particular place because there's not even though there are now so many sort of monitoring projects it's not actually producing the kind of data that enables you to think about what's the effect on for example life cycle of, of fish i did see um on grand turk i saw mangroves which were really tangled up with sargassum and i did think that was probably um you know not not doing them any good at all it's quite hard to get a handle on what sort of monitoring is going on at that kind of that kind of level and you do need you need a detailed local picture don't you in order to really tell what's going on mm -hmm. there's all this work going on about you know solutions but my first concern is that what's being ignored is the basic science, the chemistry. And um, I mean, there is that booklet produced, isn't there? Listing all the different products. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who produced it. University I think FAO um, has been producing this. Yeah. And it has a caveat. Um, in the introduction saying, you know, anything that's being used for food or livestock, um, you know, be careful because we don't know about the arsenic contamination. And I'm kind of like, well, that's so basic, isn't it? But I, I talked recently to the guys from Sea Combinator who are based in Puerto Rico and they're trying to do um, things out of sargassum like fertilizers and so on. And they said they figured out a way of removing the arsenic from the sargassum. So somehow people are yes. working on these issues. But they haven't published that. Yeah, that's true. And and we we would like to know how they're <laughs> because we're we're still working on 
you know, what form is the arsenic in? Is the arsenic, um, John has this idea that if you leave it to weather on the beach, the arsenic will magically disappear into the sand, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on your perspective. Um, anyway, so we're, we're working on that. Um, so that, that's the first thing. And the other thing is if you're going to have any kind of use for sargassum, um, you've got to know how much, if someone is going to invest in some kind of industrial process that's going to use sargassum, you need to know how much and you need to know you've got a reliable supply. For example, on South, South Caicos, I mean, to get all the sargassum off the beaches into one place to do anything with it would be quite logistically tricky. And I'm sure it's the same on other islands as well. And I, I, I because I, I work with environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment and that kind of method, I mean, where, where is it, uh, where is the sargassum that's landing up on the beach, beaches doing most damage? And where is it doing most good? Because in some places, um, you mentioned the boulders of rotting sargassum, Fran. Mm -hmm. That was where we saw most seabirds yeah. feeding, feeding on that. So during the rotting process, it's obviously providing habitat and food probably for insects, invertebrates. So maybe that's, you know, it's a lot more complicated than just saying it's a problem, we need to get rid of it. So do you think that there are actually positive aspects of the sargassum landing on the beaches? What could those positive aspects be? It's undoubtedly associated with stabilizing beaches. And when you have um, hurricanes, uh, Brigitte van Tussenberg has done work on um, the importance of sargassum when it's incorporated into the beach for um, increasing robustness against erosion. But she has also done work on the damage to seagrass meadows, hasn't she? Mm -hmm. It's a matter of, um, you know, what are the priority areas where the seagrass must be protected and the beach must be protected? And what are the areas where it's least damaging. And that's something that would have to be done on a local local scale, I think. Mm -hmm. It may also have has to do with how much sargassum comes to a beach. Like a certain uh, amount may be positive and then if it's too much it may become negative. But I don't think you can predict. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what's too much one year might not be enough the next year. But I do think um, it wasn't something we were able to explore when we were on TCI. But for example, um, turtle, turtle nesting beaches, sargassum must be a real problem for, for turtles. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that um, you know, those should be priority, their priority species, that should be priority for management. Yeah, yeah. I'd imagine, I'd imagine that the turtles would have a difficult time uh, yeah. getting through that to lay their eggs and all. And that's a, that's something I, it had not even occurred to me at this point. So thank you. For and, that out. and the baby turtles, yeah. although the floating rafts are apparently very good habitat, as I said, I'm not a marine biologist, I don't know <laughs> about any of this, but a very good habitat for the young turtles to live and grow. Oh, they love and, it when it's offshore. Yeah, and protecting them from, from predators, but for them to plough through that when they first hatch must be really challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've got a guy from the uh, Ocean Conservancy, or Ocean Society rather, going to uh, they do a lot of sea turtle work. We're we'll going to be interviewed then next year, and all. So that you just mm. gave me another question, and all. And I thank you for that. Um, mm. One thing I'm interested in, you know, I kind of told you what I did before. 
when you're, I'm guessing you talked with a lot of local people, fishermen and uh, other stakeholders when you were in the Turks and Caicos. Um, did you learn anything from just these lay people that was unexpected when you were doing your research and interviews and stuff? Um, I found some aspects of the tourist industry quite um, unusual, maybe because I hadn't ever been um, in a place like that before. I mean, Grand Turk, the fact that the cruise boat comes in and everything goes wild for two hours and then all those people get back on the cruise boat and go somewhere else. And I was just like, why would you do that? I mean, that's just not my idea of holiday at all. But you, you weren't with us, Fran, were you? Mm -mm. Um, no, Kirsty and I were sent up to Grand Turk. And um, you know, it, it was really nice. We thought it was a lovely place. There were the old salt pans from the salt industry, um, which had, had really nice birds on them. We enjoyed that. And, um, and then a cruise boat came in and it was just absolutely manic. And then it just went quiet again. It's a very odd um, aspect. And they weren't worried at all about sargassum because all the activities they did with the tourists were on the other side of the island. But the local residents had complained about the smell mm -hmm. because it comes in on the, on the windward side. And, and when we talked to them, they said, well, it's always been a problem. Which was interesting because most people think it's been a problem just the last few years. Yeah, the, uh, the, yeah, the cruise, cruise uh, tu tourism industry just baffles me as well. And, and Belize, they don't have a dock where they can, well, they do now down south. And they, once again, they dread seagrass meadows, put sealed on reefs and to fill in a mangrove island to for these tourists um but up north in belize city where they've always been coming in there may be two or three uh boats ships parked offshore and um one of my friends was a, a tour guide there so every once in a while i'd go he said come go diving with us today so i'd meet him at the dock at six o'clock right there at the um uh, at the radis in fort george and we'd take off and we'd pull up to these boats and we'd get up there to one of these ships and there'd be 40 or 50 boats around there, tour, tourism industry boats, mm -hmm. people walking down the game plank onto the boat. They A lot of them would go into, into the city to walk around, and a lot of people would go off on to different places, you know, straight off the tour boats. But there'd be, there'd be 50 boats out there, mm -hmm. uh, good-sized, you know, tourist boats, unload people off the uh, ship. And, and like I said, it's like that for a few hours, and then it all goes away. Just, yeah. you know, it's just like... Bizarre. Just like a light switch. Yeah. I, I think the other, um, we haven't talked about the dive tourism, which Fran would know far more about than I would. Um, but we talked to people from the, um, the dive tourism and they, um, they were worried about the bad publicity that the Sargassum was giving to the islands, but they weren't actually experiencing any problem. The jet skis, they reckoned that they had a really bad problem because it sucks into the engine and they have to replace, you know, so it actually effectively kills their, um, it, it's costing them a lot of money. They were the only ones apart from the hotels which were actually saying it's costing us money. But I was going to say that for the for the general tourist that wants to go to the Caribbean to do diving, they don't know about this patchiness of sargassum. They don't know that sargassum might be a problem somewhere, but not in another place. Mm. So maybe that's even if for them sargassum is not a direct problem at that time point, this bad press of sargassum being everywhere in the Caribbean is actually affecting them indirectly. Mm. And I talked to the... Um, they're called the Sustainable Tourism Group on uh, Provo, which bring together the, the tourism. And they were 
um, they weren't so worried about having to clear it up as opposed to the um, hoteliers on um, South Caicos who were, you know, they didn't want to clear it up, did they, Fran? And they, you know, they sort of just costing them money. On Provo, they didn't, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the bad publicity mm -hmm. but that they felt even... was putting people off coming. They didn't mind clearing it up. I mean, I, I suspect it wasn't in the overall scheme of things, even if they were clearing it every day, they weren't actually clearing that much. And Provo being, um, you know, Grand Turk gets it worst and moving across the islands, Provo is kind of, well, most of the sargassum has ended up on Grand Turk and islands in between. So on Provo, there's much less volume of sargassum than there is on the other islands. But even the hotels in South Caicos, I mean, yes, their main problem was clearing it up and having the means and the, the machinery and the people to do so. But at the same time, they were also very, very concerned about um, people not knowing that sargassum was a problem in the Turks and Caicos and on their um, in their establishment. So they didn't want to be um, in news articles with the name mm -hmm. of their, yeah. or even in um, scientific reports. Um, yes. They didn't want to have the name of their hotel being mentioned because then people may not come and see them, even though they, doing all the work, have found a way to clean, clear their beaches and make them enjoyable for the tourists. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, from a lot of your comments, it seems like to, to me, and you please correct me if I'm wrong about this, that you've got a, a lot of different stakeholder communities that are, are, are they coordinating with each other to, to deal with some of these things or are they just working independently of each other? And is it important for them to work together? I think that a lot of them are in competition with each other. So it'd be very difficult to get them to work together. Wow. What do you think, Fran? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think they informally maybe exchange information, but they are kind of like two different hotels are competing for customers with each other. Um, but there's definitely been some cooperation in like where to store the sargassum afterwards um, on South Caicos between the two hotels. Hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it seems like if, you, if two different people, even if they're in competition, have a shared issue that uh, we could accomplish a lot more by working together. I think if, all. supposing on South Caicos, we had come up with um, either um, the idea that it could be used for fuel, it's not very good. On um, initial, initial chemical analysis does not show that it's going to be very good for biomethane production. Or we could find a way of composting it. And the problem with composting it is that it's very high in salt. Um, so using it for any kind of fertilizer, that, that is a problem. There's not any real fresh water on South Caicos, so any idea of kind of trying to wash the salt out of it is not very good. Um, it actually, like anything else, you need to compost it with something else. And we did look at that and we thought, well, a lot of stuff comes into South Caicos. Um, does it come in in packaging like cardboard? that we could co-compost with. And what about human waste using sewage? So if we could, so if, if that would work and there was enough incentive to do that, then I think we would have been able to get those two resorts on South Caicos to work together. But for example, 
um, the sewage from one getting it to the other or to some point in the middle it's actually quite problematic isn't it mm. and that's just on one island so it's not it's all these great ideas um but actually when you get down to the detail there's the chemistry and there's the logistics and it's difficult well, since you've brought up chemistry and sewage, um, mm -hmm. what are these hotels currently doing with their sewage? Fran? I think um, on South Caicos, we don't have a sewage system. So we at School for no. Field Studies had it, um, our own chest pit, and I'm pretty sure the two hotels had a similar setup. Yeah. So, as well so, as so, local so this people. is so the sewage is essentially leaching back into the uh, lens of fresh water on the island. Well, there isn't a big fresh water lens on no. the island either. Uh -huh. It's almost certainly ending up in the sea, causing more nutrient for the sargassum. Well, they're, they're, that's what's causing the sargassum, the nutrient flow from the Turks and Caicos. Then. They're, 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 ca they're causing this whole problem. <laughs> Combined with, you know, I mean, just, just the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is really good for some plants more than others. Mm -hmm. Warmer sea temperature, more carbon dioxide in the seawater. You know, it's all very difficult to put it down to anything other than environmental change of many forms probably all of them together yeah yeah yikes <laughs> but yikes, it, I, yikes, I think yikes. It's, it's interesting because looking at Turks and Caicos and looking at South Caicos you know, just as one island, I'm just thinking, well, okay, so in one local island, we can't get to grips with this. How can we possibly get to grips with it across the whole area? Mm. You know, if we do the chemical analyses, um, you know, we're aiming to get six sets of samples from Heidi on South Caicos, uh, broken down into the three different morphotypes. What evidence do we have that if we took sargassum from you know mexico it would have the same chemical composition well you would yeah. expect that it would would be my guess right off the top of my head because you got I different would, nutrient think, outtakes i i would i would think that it would have a similar profile really hmm. I, I don't well, I don't think we could necessarily I mean where's the arsenic coming from we know well, there's arsenic I, I would speak well, there, I, I would say from? I would think there are things that are typical throughout the range but I, I would see I, I would expect variations if no other reason because yeah. the chemicals being used there's a lot more chemicals I think for whatever you know including uh, you know uh, agriculture and uh, mining industry that and, and oil, it, a lot of oil over here that's coming back into the uh, Caribbean from the mainland. And, all, I, I, and I, I would think that would change the chemical profile somewhat. And all. there'd still be those trace things you would find everywhere, but they may be absorbing some things that they don't have access to in these other places. Mm. I just think it's very hard to predict, and I think that. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, I agree with that too. Science would say, um, don't make any assumptions. Yeah, but I think it's definitely hard to find solutions for the sargassum problem, and that's one of the reasons, or the main reason, why we started with this podcast, because we want to show the different solutions and the different knowledges from. Um, different areas, different islands, because maybe one island found out something that will also work on another island. Mm. Sharing then, information is always good. Yeah. I, I think one of the errors 
you're making, and, and I think humans make this all the time, is our use of the word solution. Oh. We're, we're talking about solutions to oh. the symptoms oh. of the problem. We're not really talking about solutions to the problem itself and you know why it's being done. I mean, and, and these solutions to the symptoms are a very important thing, but we need to uh, know more about the cause and to treat yeah. the cause. If you go back to nature-based solutions, and the nature-based solutions are looking at how they can address societal problems in a way that benefit both people and wildlife, the environment. And if we look at it from that point of view, we've got to actually think about the problem and where it's a problem, rather than thinking about sargassum as a as, as a problem. Yeah. I think there are some places, I think, I mean, I would say, from a position of ignorance, I would say, I would like to know where all the turtle beaches are in the Caribbean, and I would like to know what impact sargassum is likely to have on the turtle populations if it is not kept off those beaches. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, a manageable, um, type of societal problem. Well, excellent. Does, does anybody else have anything to add at this time? No. And I'll, well, well, Debbie, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, you can tell that I enjoyed it because I was mostly silent and I was just sitting in wrapped all as you were talking. So thank you very much for that. And, I, and then and the couple of questions I did have, I felt really good about. So, you know, so, so thank you for uh, being a, a good teacher for us today. And uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope, and yeah, I hopefully. look forward to listening to all your podcasts when they become available. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know about all that. And uh, until next time, you have your, a good rest of your day. And uh, I think we've got a couple things we're going to discuss in for a minute. Thank you once again for uh, all your, for your, your time and your patience with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so Bye. much, Debbie. Thanks, Debbie. We'll keep in touch. So what did we learn today? I learned that we need to put uh, more effort into the basics of sargassum. I learned that uh, we still don't know many things. Um, and we base a lot of our ideas on how to use sargassum on assumptions that are basically not holding. Um, and I think that was what I learned today, that we actually need to go back to do the basic research on sargassum, go back to the labs and measure the chemical composition and go back to the field and look uh, who is living inside the sargassum. And maybe also what I thought about now at the end, um, to basically do more synthesis papers. You know, there's very few people writing reviews on what is known about sargassum. There are a few that came up uh, recently about the carbon content and so on, but there's still so little done in terms of integrating the knowledge because sargassum is so patchy and the areas where it lands on the beaches are also so patchy and so different um, that basically putting together all that knowledge is going to be the next uh, big thing to do. Yes, for sure. Um, I also got reminded, I already knew about these, but um, Debbie kind of reminded me of all those hurdles we have if we want if anybody wants to start an industry on sargassum so yes we have people coming up with products and some people are very successful but the seasonality of the sargassum the, the difficulty to predict when it comes to your beach or close to you know where you are working with sargassum um, not knowing exactly what type of chemical makeup it has and if it changes, if it's the same this year as it was last year. There's a lot of hurdles which are difficult to deal with. And I think we need, I know there's people working on all those things to, to make the prediction better, to, to get more chemical analysis, but it's definitely a group effort to, to go over those hurdles as well. Um, if we want to make this possible in the Caribbean to, to use sargassum as a resource, not just have it as a nuisance. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't necessarily think of the seasonality as, as really a, a negative and all except for financially. I, I, if, uh, for example, if some of these lotions and other, you know, high value, or what we hope will be high value export products, um, their scarcity during certain times of the year maybe may make them more popular. Yeah, but some years you will get more than others and you don't know. So what if you want to expand your business and start bigger plants? Are you thinking about how big of a plant should I build? How many people should I employ? And one year there's enough work for one person and the other year enough for 10 people. So it's kind of difficult to, to work with. Yeah. 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 Well, excellent. This has been a good day. Uh, a little mm -hmm. bit longer than we expected. And I'll wish you, which was, Debbie was a very interesting person. had a lot of really good input. Um, so I, uh, I appreciate having That's all we got today. We'll just, we'll just call it here. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest about sargassum. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom happy hour for Patreons, where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. This podcast was produced by Marcel van der Kamp and your hosts today were Robbie Ting, Francisca Elmer and Mar Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. Do you want to find out more about what our guests talked about today? Check our show notes for links to the documents and website. The music in this podcast is from the song Demo Pray by Drizzle Road Rama, an artist from Roatan. You can listen to the full song at the end of this episode. If you enjoy his music, then please follow him on Spotify and YouTube, where you can find more of his music. But for now, here is Demo Pray by Drizzle Road Rama. Hey brother, hear me now. Brother dog, know me. Understand Now for them no one fissy we get nothing That's why they must be at no this front and star Now for them no one fissy we get nothing That's why they must be Now for them a free Free they must free They must free me no gain progress Now for them a free They must free me no gain success Now for them a free Free they must free They must free me no gain progress Now for them a free they my pray me to reap success So me tell them yeah What is this come and me no take that Only if it come from Jah I'll accept that Now for them I put the trust in And give me set back Yo select that Will and pull up that Tell some we get a bad mind Me no fear them Anytime them cheat and chat Me no hear them Me dash a few hearts So go the queer them Me dash a few hearts So tell them where them Now for them I pray they my pray me in progress, not for them a free They my free, me to reap success So me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never would have taught me would have have fake family So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friend must lost bad mind in a real life Star, me no rate that Star, me no rate that Not me real for me would have Bust a million shot in a real life Real, real, real life Not for them a free they my pray me no gain progress, not for them a pray They my pray me no great success, not for them a pray They my pray me no gain progress, not for them a pray They my pray me no great success, so me tell them yeah Local life, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine. They my move like Judas. They my move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So they give one rash clock to a try judge me like them chit chat. So what them want to say? Cause none of them out there. Nah, Peter, but they my free. They 
them a free me no in progress not for them a free them a free me no rape success not for them a free